Okay. Um, you know what? Since you guys all been here before, I'm gonna skip this goals and assumption part because you know you, you heard this. You probably hear this every single time I teach this class. Uh, the church of Rome, you remember, so we're gonna keep going on that. I've only done this once before as part of an of an excursus. I've decided to get rid of the all the reviews of all the classes because like it's, it's kind of repetitive. Instead, I feel like this is really helpful to frame the discussion, which is Paul is struggling in the book of Romans, okay, he's not struggling, but in the book of Romans, he's really confronting the problem of God's righteousness. That God is facing a dilemma. And so Paul is trying to explain what God is up to within the constraints that God has found himself in. So let's begin. God can do whatever he wants, but by creating a world in which human beings are supposed to rule on his behalf, he's created some problems. Namely, those human beings rebelled. And now God is God is now stuck in a dilemma. He has choices, and, wh and one big choice he's used to walk away. There's always a choice that he can walk away from his creation. He doesn't do that. He's faithful. He says, "Okay, I want to fix the creation." So that's the definition of God's righteousness. God is a righteous God. He is not going to walk away from his creation, even though it's been destroyed by sin and death. Um, so, but because he is committed. He's going to fix it, and we only talk about the Noah option. One option is to destroy the world, or purge it of all sinners, all, which means you kill everybody, pretty much. Um, it demonstrates God's justice, without a doubt. God is just, he punishes sinners. Um, and fairness, because everybody gets punished. Uh, but, it's, but it's a failure, because all humanity would be destroyed. There's no such thing as restoring the world. The world is not restored in, in, in this scheme. So what's the point, right? Uh, the number two is the Jewish option. Um, he created a small group of people out of a person named Abraham, called them together, gave them the, the, his relationship with them, a covenant. So they all, these are, these are people who are no longer idolaters. They actually worship the true God. And um, so he could just, at the, you know, punish all the idolaters just and vindicate these guys, and have them run the world. Uh, and that would, um, well, it would first of all, be he, he would demonstrate his faithfulness to his relationship with Abraham, the covenant he made with Abraham, to use them, and that's good. But the only problem is, uh, since the Jews are just as sinful and unfaithful as the rest of the world, you didn't actually solve the underlying problem. The world is not restored, it's still run by sinful humans, right? It just so happens that these sinful humans know about God. I guess it's an improvement. <laughs> and you know, they know about God, uh, but they're not better than anybody else. And that doesn't work. Okay. Any questions on this so far? I think I talked about this once before, but I think the big picture helps. And now, so, what I said was this, the two proposed solution points out the problem. There's no new world without a renewed humanity. So you choosing based on whatever criteria among flawed humanity cannot be the basis of a new world. God must do something to renew humanity, to create a new race of people who have the Torah written on their hearts. Now the Torah cannot achieve this. The Jewish people with the law cannot achieve the transformation. How do we know this? Because they've had it for generations. In fact, they got it. If you, the Old Testament story is a story of a people with the Torah who fail. I mean, that's the whole point of the Old Testament. If you look at the trajectory of the storyline, failure, 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 all the way to the end until God says enough is enough. We're done with this. Right? So the, the, the people gets, you know, gets, gets exiled and the land is just, um, the, the monarchy is destroyed. Okay. So Jews have had it for generations that has not accomplished this renewal. And everybody knows that storyline. The fact that Jews are living in the diaspora, in Rome, is a daily reminder that the Torah fails. Okay. Now, we what chapter, that's chapter 1 and 2, really, lays out the problem. Chapter 3 is the Jesus option. Right? The righteousness of God revealed, okay, apart from the Torah, though prophesied by the Torah in which God puts forth Jesus as a new Philisterion, a new ark cover that, that really represents God's presence. So we have this new Jesus option, and those who believe in Jesus as God's Messiah encounter God via the new ark cover, the place of God's presence, hence the new temple, and are reconciled to him through grace, accomplished via the faithfulness of Jesus. So Jesus is faithful, Therefore, God, using that faithfulness and his blood, made him the new ark cover, the new temple, and now we all enter in and receive grace from God. And the faith marks them off as the people who will be vindicated in the final judgment. Okay? That's, okay, that's cool, kind of. I mean, there's questions, right? Like, wait a minute, why is this a better thing than the Torah? Okay. Now, Paul doesn't go there directly. 
the first thing he answers, the first question he answers in chapter four is, um, well, this new faithfulness to the, is actually um, faithfulness to the covenant with Abraham. Because God's promise to Abraham was always about faith. So what he's saying is, look, this, whatever this thing doing, is going on is in continuity with the Abrahamic covenant. So we're not doing something that's a, a different character entirely. Abraham was about faith. This is about faith. So we're good. Okay, at least on that score. Okay. Um, but it doesn't answer the, the question that we're having in mind, which is, um, how are these people different than the Jews? The new Jesus people. The people who are born out of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. How are they different? So, we have chapter 5. Uh, Paul demonstrates that Jesus' option is in continuity with his covenant with Abraham. Um, it, and, and, and as well as establishing this idea of kingdom of sin and kingdom of grace. And that's all from last time. And then chapter 6, just today, we're going to be looking at how the Jesus option maintained God's faithfulness to his commitment toward restoring the world. That is to say, chapter 6, you'll find out how these people are different. Okay. God has created a different kind of humanity and that these people are going to live out God's justice and God's standard for the world. But remember, the, the big questions haven't been answered, which is, what about the Torah? Right. Um, actually, it's not chapter 8. I, I, I was going to do 9 through 11, but I messed up. Chapter 7 answer, answers the question, what about the Torah? What's the function of that? And then chapter 9 through 11 answers the question, what about the Jews who do not believe in Jesus? So you see this, this question that it's really motivating, animating Paul is really the Jewish question, the Torah question. Okay. And, and, you'll see, and you see this nonstop throughout this Romans 1 through 11. Um, we don't touch 9 through 11. Um, we're gonna, only going to get to 8, 7 and 8 next week. Sorry, this is wrong. I was typing in 9 through 11 this morning. I put in 8 by accident. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. <clears throat> Solving the basic pro questions. The no option, forget that. The Jewish option doesn't work. How will God remain faithful to both the covenant with Abraham as well as create a new people? And how is, it, how is God faithful to Abraham and his people if the Torah doesn't do anything? And what about the people who are, who are already part of that covenant? What happens to it? Okay. Big questions. So you're saying that's what 9 to 11 That's what 9 to 11 is about. 9 to 11 is all about, what about the Jews? Okay. You can say, okay, the original covenant of Abraham is about faith. Okay, so this is what we're, happening. what we're doing now with Jesus is in continuity with that. That's fine. Chapter 7, what is, the, what is the function of the original Torah anyway? What was the point of it? Okay, so it's been chapter 7 talking about that. But then, rubber meets the road. What about the people? Right? What about the Jewish people who are actually following that covenant? What about them? Okay. So, so, you, so that you said that's so nine to eleven is what about the Jews? Yes. What's chapter eight? Chapter eight is a is the uh, final okay, sorry finality of the new people of God, the new creation in Christ. Okay. So chapter so it's interesting. Chapter six you really should jump to eight, but seven comes in because he's he's really he's really constantly balancing these ideas, and he says. Eight is eight. He, he puts seven out there. There's a problem with the Torah, and then eight is like now we now we've broken free from it. Thank God. Okay, and then nine. By the way, what about the Jews? So so he's these are so so in in this way of reading, we don't have a break at one through eight, nine through eleven, which is what many people have. We have a one continuous, continuous struggling with this issue of how does Jesus? How is Jesus um, a faithful response to both fixing the world? And being faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. Okay. So and those eight questions. It is basically a final. A final culmination. Final, of, cul culmination of why the Jesus option is a good option. Exactly. It's the culmination part of that. But he he wanted to put seven in front because he wanted to talk about life before the Jesus option. <coughs> okay. So you want to accentuate the degree to which the superiority of the eight by by comparing the seven, or or Jesus option compared to the Jewish option. Okay, <clears throat> so let's move forward. Um, so this was last week, 
Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things. I don't want to go through all of it. This is the last few verses from chapter 5. Uh, we're talking about Jesus, and he was contrasting and comparing Jesus and Adam. Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The Torah came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, remember last time we talked about, he was talking about this kind of parallel thing between Adam and Jesus, and that we said it's parallel but not equal, right? So we talked about it, breaking a vase and fixing the vase are parallel acts, but they're not equal acts. One is act of you know one-time accidents. Another one is painstaking care to put it back together. Tremendous. It's, it's completely different kind of thing. So what we have here is one man's act lead to condemnation. Uh, one man's that righteousness lead to act of requital in life for all men. Um, and here we continue the major theme of um, the law came in. Um, okay, let's just kind of go through this briefly. Parallel between Jesus and Adam, um, and then. The function of the law, once again, we're going to see a lot more than Romans 7, but the Torah increases trespass. And we're going to see that again and again. Uh, what is exactly the Torah for? And grace is sufficient. And then you see, once again, sin reigned in death, right? So that's a sin reigned in death, grace might reign through righteousness. So we have this kingdom idea that sin rules and grace rules, a two different kingdom. Um, and this, this is the foundational understanding for understanding Romans 6 that's coming up. Okay. That's from last time. So let's tackle today um, chapter 6 and the first six verses of chapter 7. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Yes. Okay, sorry. No, <laughs> by no means. By no means. How can we who died into sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the sinful body might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. But if, who, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lived, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay. A lot of stuff will unpack it. But the big question here, I think a lot of people may, may be worried about Paul's gospel. Which is, he's telling people, oh, you're a Christian, if you're, if you're a Gentile believer, you don't have to follow the Torah. Right. Now, we think Torah, oh, it's all about you know, ritual laws like Sabbath keeping or food laws. Yeah, but there's pretty important stuff in there, like do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. There's some good stuff in there, right? There's some very fundamental little basic things in the Torah, such as, you know, if you want to drop the Sabbath, remember Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments. Do you drop everything else in the Ten Commandments? So question that people might have with, with Paul, Paul keeps saying, well, Torah is increasing trespasses. We have this thing that's apart from the Torah. It's a new righteousness. Okay. What happens if you're under grace? Does that mean you can do whatever you want? Does that mean you can sin? It just, does it just not matter? What's the mechanism by which the people who receive vindication as a gift of grace, completely as a gift, what is the, what is the mechanism by which they live out a superior life? How does that work? So the chapter six is a critical question, critical answer to that question. Okay. Um, so, first thing to notice about this passage is that there are three major themes that get repeated over and over again. Um, what's in red is just death words. Lots of it. Death to sin, right? Death. Okay, I put in buried. Okay, that's that's kind of related to death, and it's not the actual death word. Death, death, death. Which is you know, crucified. Okay, once again, not exactly a death word, but pretty close. So you see it. It just this whole passage is just popping out. It's about death, right? That's one. Um, the other word that's popping out is life. Right. See the yellow words, raised from the dead, 
life, resurrection, live, raised, life he life he lives, he lives to God. Whoa. Okay. And alive, right? And and Greek, these are related words. Now raised is not, but you know, Agairo is not, not not one of those. But so he's raised from the dead. Okay. That's pretty cool. So we have these new life or new life theme that's popping up. Okay. The third idea in here, um, that kind of that connects the two mm. together is baptism. Right. Baptized, baptism, baptize. And those three shows up, up three times. Okay. And that is the, the kind of the, the linchpin that ties this thing together. And if we want to understand this passage, we need to understand baptism. Okay. So Paul is doing something kind of interesting here. He he has a fundamental assumption that everybody gets what he means by baptism. Okay. Which is a interesting assumption. But let's let's play around a little bit about how Paul views baptism. He talks about baptism elsewhere in other letters, so we can, maybe we can start from there a little bit. Uh, first thing you, in 1 Corinthians 10, I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What's he talking about? Crossing the He's talking about crossing the Red Sea. And he, he, he sees that as an act of baptism. Okay, so first, we can just remember, there's, nothing, there's no baptism in the Old Testament. Yeah, so what did I refer to as the same baptism? Yeah, there's no baptism in the Old Testament. Okay, baptism is not a rite. Of, there's cleansing rite, cleansing rituals, which a lot of people draw, t t try to, a lot of people say, oh, the Christian baptism is a cleansing, cleansing ritual. Uh, that's, not, that's not what the New Testament writers are actually saying. Paul is saying, Paul is saying, baptism relates to, to Moses, right? There's a baptism that's related to Moses and in the crossing of the Red Sea. That's somehow he's seeing as an act of baptism, at least a type, something that's foreshadowing baptism. Okay. So that's one. So what does it mean to be baptized into Moses? Good question. Great question. We'll have to keep going. <laughs> okay, let's let's explore a little bit more because that, that that doesn't make any sense. Like, what the heck does that mean? And how can you be baptized into Moses? Okay, so let's move forward. First Corinthians twelve. He talks about, about baptism a little bit more. He says, "For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink one Spirit." How does those two phrases? fit together. The, if we, if we get the Jews or Greeks, the slaves or free, just drop that. Baptized into one body, made to drink one spirit. How do they connect? Is it? I can't remember the exact passage, but did no. you refer to the rock that Moses struck? Uh, not in this one. Okay. No, no, this is about Jesus now. Okay. Right. So this is by the one spirit, by the, by the one spirit. So how is this connecting? See, see, in, in this verse is, is, is fascinating because this idea of all of us are now in a single body, and but because you're in that body, you're doing what? You're drinking the spirit inside the body. Whose body is that? The body and the drink feels a whole lot like communion. Yes, yes, except you're in the body. It's not the body in you. It's interesting. I think it's, I think it's, I think you're, you're onto something there. Exactly, is that there's a mix, there's a there's an intentional mixing here going on. It's communion, you're eating the body, but symbolically, but but in, but what Paul's saying is you're actually baptized into Jesus' body, and because you're in Jesus' body, what happens? You drink His Spirit, because you're inside Him. It's kind of weird. Eh? So this is a spatial. Think spatially. Communion meets John 20. Yeah. yeah. So visual, visualize a body that's Jesus' body that's being really, really big. And everybody's inside it. Okay? And, and because of that, we're all drinking the same spirit, the Jesus' spirit. The Jesus' spirit is inside Jesus' body. We're all soaked in it. We're just like drinking it. The body is weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what would baptism mean in 1 Corinthians 12? It's like you're entering in. Entering in. Baptism, in there. baptism is an entering in process. 
right? You're, you're, into, you're back into one body. Now, to be baptized into a body, look at the imagery of baptism. To immerse, you sink into it. The imagery of baptism is to be immersed into something. Galatians 3. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Once again, very spatial, very uh, uh, clothing-like. I baptized into Christ, so Christ is now on top of me. I've, I've, I've closed myself with Christ. So Christ is on the exterior, I'm inside. Baptism is a enter into uniting with something language, right? We can see that in these two usages. Now that one becomes a little weird. How can they put on Moses? You know, is that, does that, is that, do they get joined in the most in some way? But, okay, we, we don't have to put, touch that immediately. But down here, the Christian baptism is certainly a sense of uniting with Christ. Colossians 2.12, and you were buried with him in baptism, and in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So once again, there is a immersion, there's a joining idea, in which then whatever happens to Jesus happens to you. Right, so you were baptized, you were buried within the baptism. So he got buried, you got buried. And there, if he got raised, well, you got raised. There's the, once again, joining idea. Any questions on this? I mean, this is just some of the, this is what Paul, what Paul says about baptism in his letters. So there's nothing similar in Jewish? Yeah, okay. we'll have to get to that because he does talk about um, uh, Moses. So we'll have to look at Moses, but we'll keep going. But you're right, there's, there's nothing in Jewish ritual uh, dealing with baptism as a any kind of initiatory ritual. It's just they think about cleansing, washing of hands, which is... But then what was John doing before he baptized Jesus? Let's keep going. Um, New Testament, other New Testament understanding of baptism. Thanks for that. I'll give you five bucks. Later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's very meaningful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, so Matthew, so Jesus, Jesus says this. Oh no, so Matt, John the Baptist says this. He says in Matthew, I baptize you with water for repentance. Okay. But, the, but, but the, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, now here's a different one, right? Paul is talking about baptizing as joining. John the Baptist is talking about baptism that seems to be the communication of an internal transformation like repentance I repent I change that's one and then on the other side with power okay that certainly is a different understanding of baptism than what Paul is talking about right sorry another question did the Jews baptize non-believers when they became Jewish I thought they got circumcised I'm circumcised okay. I'm just curious yeah, you to be a Jew, you be, you get circumcised. Are oh, you talking about like the God fearers? Yeah, I think talking about God fearers. So, for example, like today, even today, women who who convert go through a ritual cleansing. Yeah, a ritual cleansing. Uh, they do a soak, um, but it's not. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I wanted yeah. the, the 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 fire thing. I mean, fire is a purifying thing. Right? Yes. Yes. So cleansing and power. That's a, what John the Baptist is seem to be suggesting baptism is related to. Um, and then John, in John 1, they asked John the Baptist, why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? So something is very interesting here um, in, 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 in John that baptism is related to the coming of Christ or Elijah or the prophet. Now these three figures are both what we call final age figures. The coming of the Messiah, coming of Elijah who precedes the Messiah, or the prophet, which is the prophet that, that Moses prophesied. It says there'll be a prophet like Moses at the end days to come who's like Moses. So these figures are all the, you know, somebody who will show up who is at the end of time, at end of, and for the final age. And so baptism is somehow related to the final age in some ways, related to the coming of the kingdom of God in some ways. Okay. So we have that in John as well as in, in in Matthew, because Holy Spirit is related to the final age as well. So we have some different ideas in, in the other parts. And then we have 1 Peter, which is really strange. Um, it's a strange book, no matter how you, I mean, there's, there's parts of it that are odd. But here we go. Uh, 
who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. So now we have a clear cut. One New Testament author has come out and said, baptism is really about, like, Noah and the flood. <laughs> right? Nobody's really talking about cleansing rituals. Okay? One, one, Paul went with Moses. Peter is going with Noah. John the Baptist is talking, in, in, the, in the Synoptic Gospel, is talking about Holy Spirit and fire. And that it's related to the Messiah or to Elijah, and to some kind of eschatological figure. Okay. It's a very strange thing that's going on here. So uh, I, but someone have the same source of information or... I'm sorry? They have the same source of information or well, same well, idea? Well, I think that... So I would say they're working off some similar underlying understanding. So I'm going to try to pull it together. Okay? So I'm going to try to pull it together. These are, we have diff disparate data, but we think they're talking about some, some similar underlying concepts about baptism, in which it comes out in different ways, with different emphases. Okay? So I'm hoping there's a unity here. So let's see if you guys buy it. Okay? <laughs> so whatever you want to talk about, the idea here is that they're drawing from Old Testament. There's no getting around that. Right? Noah, Elijah, Christ, the prophet, coming of the Holy Spirit, these are Old Testament ideas. And the baptism is related to some kind of Old Testament idea. Um, so let's go from there. The sign of the covenant is circumcision. There's no baptism in the Old Testament. Um, we have Noah and Moses. Let me start from the very beginning, and then maybe we can see if we can catch the, catch the idea here being, 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 being referenced. Um, Genesis 1, now the earth was, now baptism and quotes in the Old Testament, okay, it doesn't exist. <laughs> now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, the word is ruach, it could also mean wind, it could be a wind of God, or a great wind was hovering over the waters. Okay. Um, and God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And so it was so, and God called the expanse sky, or heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Uh, Genesis 1, 9, 10 through 10, uh, God said, let water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry, dry ground appear. And it was so, and God called the dry ground land. And gather water called seeds, and God saw that it was good. So what we have here in the Old Testament, Genesis 1, is the imagery beginning with darkness and water. Okay, now we think, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that, you know, I thought we have creation out of nothing. Genesis 1 adopts the ancient Near Eastern understanding that the, that the world begins with chaos rather than emptiness. So that's, they, they use the, that, the assumptions of that world, which means darkness and water is utterly inhospitable to life. Water in ancient, in, in ancient Israel was a symbol of evil and chaos. Okay, it's a symbol of, of, of what is wrong. In fact, the sea is the name of a Canaanite god, Yom. It's like you have to kill. This, this picture, we have a picture of Yom being split open. Is really what's going on here. The, the sea is being chopped in half, and the heaven gets built right in the middle of it. Okay, so we have these kind of picture. Water is chaos. Water is dangerous. And um, God splits the water, he creates heavens, a space of structure and orientation, a place of his reign, and then he splits the water again, he does it twice. And here now he creates land, and that's a place of sustenance, a place of potential life, potential for human reign. Human life is made possible through splitting of water. You want to think about it that way. So that's, that's Genesis 1, the imagery of water breaking open, human life now is possible, potential for life. <clears throat> and uh, there's a Ruach hanging around from, from the beginning, the God's spirit. Okay, any questions on that? That's the kind of imagery. Now, this is the imagery that people are going to put. The, 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 uh, how, long, uh, the, how long does the water equals chaos and evil type picture last? Because you've got, does it last all the way to John and Revelation, beast coming out of the sea? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. Empires come out of sea. They're they're beasts. They're these are empires. These are these are nations that are first of all they're beastly. They're not human empires. And second, they come right out of the source of evil. And second, in the new heaven, new earth, there's no 
no C. No C is gone. So the symbolism, the, the John, John in the Revelation totally gets the symbolism here. He's like, there's no C anymore, and no darkness. Genesis 1, darkness is gone, C is gone, because those were both symbols of what is inhospitable, darkness and water. Right? We're going to wipe that out completely. Okay? What God did in Genesis 1 was to set bounds on them, separating light and darkness and creating this rhythm in, in, in Revelation. It's a complete erasure of what is evil. Nice, very nice. Exactly what's going on in, 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 in Revelations. Okay, so now you're getting, you, you, you get, you're, you're catching on to, to, to the picture here, and now we get to Noah, and which is what Peter uh, references as being the source material for, for, for baptism. Uh, remember, we're dealing with ancient Near Eastern cosmology, in which we have a tripartite view of the world. Land, water, heaven, water. Hmm? That's what Genesis 1 shows you, right? Genesis 1 says, water everywhere, all dark. S put an expanse in the middle, call that heaven or sky. It's in Hebrew, it's called a rakia. The translate is firmament. Something that's pretty solid, that's able to keep the water above. And then down here, we have land popping up, water, sea on this side, or two, 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 two other sides, right? And then what happens when it rains? You open windows so water can get through. We're dealing with ancient Near Eastern cosmology, ancient Near Eastern understanding of the world. It's tripartite. This level, this level, this level. Okay. So what happens in Noah is really a disintegration of the original structure, right? God just let water in the deep burst forth. So the water that was contained on the side burst open the, over, over the land, and then all the windows of heavens were opened. So the water's just pouring down. Like just uh, take it one step back. If you see it that way, you see heaven is really pushing back the forces of chaos and protecting Earth. So you have to understand even that very basic understanding of heaven being very close and very much protecting us from the from forces of chaos. So now here what you have is this, well, re renewed warfare of water upon land, upon life. So Genesis 7:19, and the waters prevailed. The word there, gavar, means to battle and to win. Okay, it's, it's a war figure. Prevail kind of catches that, but it's really conquered. It's probably a better word. The water conquered so widely upon the earth that all the high mountains and the whole heaven were covered. Just, okay. um, so he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground, and men and animals and creeping things and birds of the earth. What we have here are languages right out of Genesis 1. You have to go back and look at it. I don't have time to show all of that. But what's going on here is a reversal of Genesis 1, a, a uncreation. Okay, so th there's, there's explicit echoes of Noah to Genesis 1. Okay. The lower half of the organized world is now being reclaimed by the chaotic water, except for one place. There is a little floating ark in which all the animals sit there. All of God's creation now is now sitting right there. The water has reconquered everything. Right. Okay. Now, so only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts of the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. Ruach comes back. We have the Ruach Elohim in Genesis 1. We got a Ruach, a wind that's blowing. See, you can either call, you can say spirit if you want. Because <laughs> it's, it's the same word, right? He's pl it's, this is the winning word. And once again, the water is being blown away and a reversal of... The, the conquering and the dry land is now exposed again. Okay, so so if you want to talk about this as a, a type of baptism, then we would say this: in the initial picture of Genesis one, water splitting open. If that, you've got to call that a baptism, we're talking about potential of a new life. Baptism represents water coming apart, open, p new life pushing forward. Noah would deal with both a renewing, a washing away of sin, and just washing away of sin and punishment and judgment, and then um, opening up to a new creation. Right. So these two pictures of, Gen of Genesis one and Genesis seven, if we we're to draw baptism out of these two pictures, we would be dealing with creation, new creation. Uh, we would be dealing with judgment um, and, and, and and washing away of sin. Okay, any questions on these? Okay. 
and we then we get to then we get to Paul's use of Moses. And this is not just Paul. This is this is, I think, Old Testament people understood there's a connection between this passage and Genesis one and Genesis seven. Um, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east ruach and turned it into a yavasha, dry land. Wait a minute, this, this dry land language is just like. And the waters were divided, splitting the water, and Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Okay. That's interesting. Right. So water splitting open. Now this time, if you want to see this as baptism, the story gets more full. It is the, it's not just merely new creation, it's about escaping oppression. Right? They were being chased by the Egyptian army. So they were, they were enslaved, and this is the path to freedom. So freedom from oppression, and it's a water creating dry ground, and people new, a new people of God is birthed through this. And once again, it's enabled by the Ruach. Okay. Now, Isaiah recounts the story. Isaiah, hundreds of years later, he recounts the story, um, and, and, and you notice something interesting happens. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses his servant, where, where is he who brought up out of the sea the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his holy ruach, who caused his glorious arms to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths? Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Notice, wind became holy ruach, holy spirit. Even by Isaiah, even by Isaiah's time, there was a reinterpretation, a re-understanding of what's happening in Moses' time. That the wind he's talking about is really the Holy Spirit. Okay. So water spirit, water spirit. Just think about the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus. You must be born from above. Okay, so this is where I, I, I don't like people's... I, I, I'm a little... Okay, so I'm going to go off a slight tangent, sorry. Because people talk about being born again. I'm, I'm really frustrated by that. Because they so clearly misunderstood. It's almost a... We, we're making the same mistake that Nicodemus makes. Because the word anothan, Greek, has two meanings. From above or again. Okay. Okay? Now, when Jesus says, you must be born, which one did he mean? You must be born another. You must be born again or born from above. Nicodemus takes the again. Nicodemus says, I can't go to my mother's womb and be born again. That's silly. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You must be born from water and the spirit. He's not talking about being born again. He's talking about being born from the above, from above. So that's to me is the frustrating part about it. we keep saying be born again. No, 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 no. He's talking about a, a different kind of birth is not go through the birth canal again. That's precisely the mistake that Nicodemus made. He's talking about being born from above, a, new, a different kind of birth. Right? And the water... Would Jesus and Nicodemus have been speaking in Greek? Well, that's really the problem, right? So, I mean, is there the same ambiguity in the Aramaic term? So that's, that's, that's really the problem. We can only go with what John records. I, 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 should, I should look into that. I don't know that. But what I'm getting at is the, the ambiguity is in Greek, and that's what's being played off. Mm -hmm. And Nicodemus is going, well, you can't go through your mother's womb again. That's, that's, reborn, that's what it means to be born again, right? Duh. And, and, and Jesus is like, no, I meant more from above. <laughs> I meant water in the spirit. Don't you know this? Right? You're a teacher of Israel. How can we not know? You don't know this. Right? This is, he's talking about water in the spirit. Panuma, spirit, means both water and the wind. The spirit and the wind. So, what if Nicodemus knew the answer? In what? It's like Jesus said, "Well, you should know the answer. You should know that we should be born above." Yeah, yeah. But you know, is there any indication in the Old Testament that he got the answer from? Could have got the answer from? Yeah. Is there? Well, this is, see, this is where we're kind of getting into this, right? We're, we're touching on this idea of of new life transformation, which a new covenant, new transformation is all showing up, and 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 Jesus is clearly accessing this language right here. And he's saying, this is, this, is not, this is a story about the new way of life that is about transformation. That comes out of a separating of water 
enabled by the Ruach. In, in Greek, we pneuma, which also means, which has the same pun. It could mean wind, which means spirit, which is why right down below in that same passage, he, Paul, Jesus is talking about the wind blows where it wills. He's talking about the pneuma, the spirit blows where it will, right? This is a, this is the whole idea. You don't, you don't you don't know where it's coming from. It doesn't. It, you cannot control that. This this new way of new way of life. This new way of birthing. Charles, what's the Greek word that could mean again or anothen? A n o t h e n. It could mean both born from above or born again. Thank you. And Nicodemus took one. And we keep repeating his mistake because <laughs> we because we confuse people when they say born again. We've been born twice. No, no, no. It's a it's a fundamentally a different birth. So therefore, it should be called again. So why is it born of the water then? I mean, that seems to be like a step back. Then. Yeah. You were, were... Well, I, I think both from the water and the spirit. So I think he's referencing water and the spirit is referencing these things. Water, the, the splitting of water, and the and the and the spirit and the spirit enabling that. Okay. So. Let me get to the um, the one in Joshua, which isn't referenced by any of the New Testament writers, um, except N.T. Wright believes that this is the meaning of John's baptism, which explains the conversation he has with people in, in, in the book of John. So, but it's not explicit, but let's try it first. Is that a geographical argument? Yes, a geographical argument, which you heard about. You, mean, you just said John the Baptist and John the writer of the gospel. Yeah, John the writer of the gospel, yeah. Let me, let me get to that. Let me, let me clarify. Okay, so first of all, we have another picture of water splitting open. Uh, when people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage. By the way, that's a picture of the Jordan, okay? It's like, flood stage? Jeez. <laughs> okay, okay, maybe, maybe it was more water back then. There I don't was. know, but it's not that impressive. Huh? There was. Way upstream in the Jordan, they've taken all the water out. Oh, really? Have they? Yes. Okay, so let, now it looks kind of pathetic. <laughs> it's like, God, this is the muddy water here. Okay. Uh, Jordan is at flood stage, all during harvest. Yet, as soon as a priest would carry the ark, reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water's edge. Remember, the, the covenant, the, the ark, is a kind of symbol of God's presence, right? And then it gets there, they touch the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away in a town, call, a town called Adam. That's just amazing. Okay, in the vicinity of Zarathon, while the water flowing down to the sea to Araba was completely cut off. So the people crossed. Over opposite Jericho, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh stood firm on dry ground, there go dry ground again, in the middle of all the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Okay. Now, is this a picture of baptism? But we're getting this motif of water stopping, dry ground creating, and then people going through. Right? This, this so we have creation, potential for life. We have... We have uh, in Noah, judgment and with a new creation, and then we have escape from slavery, and now we have entrance into the promised land, entrance into the promised land for a new kingdom. Okay, that God's going to establish here. And N.T. Wright argues that look, this is where John the Baptist chose to do baptism. He did it there, right? And which is why people came up and says, "Are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet?" Why are you doing it there? Are you suggesting that you are creating a new entrance into the promised land? Are you recreating Israel? Okay. And by the way, um, people who cross the Jordan with water split and open, not just this, also Elijah and Elisha both do it. Okay. They just strike the water, water splits up, they cross. It's that re-entry into the promised land that, that the prophet, the person prophet, represents the new co the coming of the of the of the of the, Israel, of the people of God. That is embodied in the, in the prophet. So when John does this, he has all these echoes that he's he's accessing in the Old Testament, which is why it's not surprising that people come and say, "What are you trying to do here, buddy? Are you Elijah? Are you the the Christ?" Right. So that may be what's going on here. Any, any questions? Why does John start baptizing? Just taught uh, by God? <clears throat> well, I think, I think the understanding is he, this, he's this, he is, if, if you want to symbolize to everybody via your action that we are creating the new Israel, new people of God, and that the king of this nation is coming, as he believes, the one way you do that is you go to Jordan, where Israel crossed into the Canaan, so many years ago, across from Jericho, you go there and you dump people in water and bring them out. 
to symbolize a renewed entrance in the promised land. And that symbolic act speaks louder than anything you can say. So did he invent baptism? Or was he just using Old Testament motif? In which everybody goes, oh, that's what he's doing, yikes. We're getting a little nervous here. There's a whole bunch of people getting, a whole bunch of people reenacting the entry to the promised land over there. Sounds like an invasion. Sounds like a political force. Sounds like a rebellion that's been fomenting. But other people were baptized. Because in Luke it says that the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Yeah. So uh, baptism was going on all over the place. By John, to Baptist. No, but Pharisees and experts who were not baptized by John yeah. were then not happy. Yeah, they, they didn't go and get baptized. They're not baptized at all. They're not oh, baptized okay. at all. Yeah, yeah, there was no oh, baptism. I thought baptized by John. No, 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 no. There's an, no, no baptism. They didn't go through this, this, this. I just can't imagine getting into that water. But okay, <laughs> that's like. But they didn't do this. Okay. okay. But did the Maccabees do anything like that? I don't know. The, I, I, not in my readings, but I, can, I cannot say for sure. They missed out big time. <laughs> I'm sorry. They missed out big time then. The Mac, the Maccab I mean, on some really important symbolism. Oh yeah, they could. Have, they should have done that, huh? Yeah, I don't know anything about that. I don't think they did that. Wait, so, John was the only guy baptizing anybody. No, no Jesus's disciples were all also baptizing. Right after, at the same place. Post John. Yeah, post John. John showed up, and then Jesus showed up, and they were baptized in the same place. But if you're doing it in Jordan, you're doing the similar kind of things. You're, 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 the symbolism is, is 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 understood. So. Just saying, John invented the. This well, baptism. this is where it's hard to know, right? Because okay. we don't have any, we don't think that anybody else before that was doing that. And we have no record of it in the Old Testament. We have all these water splitting open kinds of things. Except that there's a word for it. Baptizo? It just means to immerse, to soak. It's a good Greek word for dumping something into water. <laughs> Same thing you do with your dishes. Yeah, you, you right. baptize your. Yeah, just it, it just means this. It, 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 it means into new life. It means it, it, it means to immerse. Just put the water, put the thing in. Okay. So so that's that's what the word means. So but the Romans didn't. No. Get much into it. Like oh, whatever. Yeah, it's a, it's a no, perfectly happy word. Baptizo. No, but but the act of being baptized. In oh. The well, I mean, so so yeah. Did, did, Whatever, we'll just crush them anyway. Well, did, 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 did the, well, the Romans get that, and that's precisely the point. I think what, what it's, you know, you're talking about dog whistle, right? Uh, the, for the term these days being used to say when you, you you say something in a way that only a certain segment of the population understand what you're getting at. Mm. Okay, that's what John was doing. John was doing that dog whistle by dumping water, dumping people in water in Jordan. All the people who know the Old Testament going, "Holy cow, really? He's doing it." Okay, and the Romans like, huh? <laughs> what's going on over there? That's weird. I don't know what's going on, but I don't know what it means, right? So dog whistle. That's what's happening. If you're if you're John the Baptist and you're saying a new kingdom is coming, we're gonna throw over to the Romans, and you don't want to get yourself hung up on a cross very quickly, you do stuff like this, right? You do the dog whistle stuff, and that's what John did. Any and questions? Jesus says you need to. Baptize me. Right? Yeah. Why Jesus? Why Jesus? So yes, it's a very good question. I think Jesus understood John as a priestly figure, a prophet figure. Sorry, in the, in the Old Testament, a prophets bapt prophet anoints kings. So he under he understood the proper the proper relationship between between uh, uh, John the Baptist and himself is that he's the Messiah. Then he needs to be the anointing of a prophet. So he understood John John that way. This, this is the right way to do it. Yeah. I mean, Joshua had to cross the yeah. Jordan as Jesus well. Jesus needs so, to cross, well, yeah. yeah so. And Joshua is Jesus, so yeah. yeah. So there we go. He, to come back, remember, jo Jesus is actually uh, a, a, sorry, let me back this up. Jesus is the same as Joshua in the original language. So basically, John the Baptist went ahead and did this thing, and he got a guy named Joshua. And he says, "Hey, look at him. He will lead you." He didn't say that, but he's the one. He's the one. Joshua, uh, really seriously? <laughs> it's like, duh. <laughs> like you know, it's like how 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 off do you have to be, right? They named him Joshua. Anyway, new Joshua crosses the Jordan, and enters into the Promised Land. Goodness gracious, you can't miss that. Okay, but let's get back to baptism. A summary. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's a repeated literary motif of water split open and dry ground appearing. This dry ground is essential for life. And we have, in creation, God conquers the forces of chaos to produce space for human life. 
In the flood, we have God destroys human sin to create moral space for human society. Exodus, God destroys the forces of oppression, destroys the, drop the of, uh, to bring freedom for his people. And then Joshua, God brings people into the land of his promise, the first step in the creation of a new nation. Okay. So we have these ideas of, of baptism, I think. And then we have, we throw Paul into this now. Paul, um, I think using all of this and say there is a new baptism that is baptizing into Christ, which accomplishes all of this. Okay. Whereas previously, if you think about it, God created, destroyed forces of chaos, produced space for human life, what Adam and Eve do, Eve do, they rebuild. Recreation with Noah, first thing that happens, Noah gets drunk, family falls apart. Exodus, they get out of, uh, they get out of Egypt, they go into this Mount Sinai, they immediately do the golden calf thing. They, Joshua, they bring people into the promised land, and what they do, they rebuild. We have these repeated motifs and failure, and now we have a new act of baptism in, in which we baptize into Christ, and somehow this baptism allows us to escape sin's oppression. Okay, actually once and for all, finally. Okay, so baptism, if we take all of those that we just looked at as being kind of the background material that, that Paul is drawing from, he's saying, look, we enter into Christ, we, we get into Christ, and we're gonna accomplish all the things we just talked about. And, uh, and the way it's done is we can either explain this some kind, as a metaphysical, a real connection between us and Jesus something like it or covenantally if you want Jesus is the Messiah the covenant represents his covenant people either way we're dealing with Jesus and what happens to him happens to us that's the mechanism at work here All right so if that is the case we're buried and we're raised so if Jesus died we died Jesus represents us and this is actually this is where it's important it's not a metaphor we have to have actually died in some way. Right? This is an actual important argument for Paul. Okay? Our, our escape from sin is contingent upon us dying. So we died. Um, we are saved from the oppression of sin because we died along with Jesus. And once we're dead, we, we're not part of sin's kingdom anymore. Okay. For he who has died is freed from sin. He's going to actually play with this a little further down. We'll see him more clearly. Um, and we're alive in Christ. So let's even put it this way. This probably might be a way for you to see this. You have the kingdom of sin, which we lived in under ever since Adam. And then Jesus created a new kingdom of grace. Jesus comes into the kingdom of sin. He dies and he resurrects. And via baptism, um, we join Jesus. So we join him in his death over here, we join him in his resurrection over here, which means now we no longer live over there, we died. From sin's perspective, these people are dead people. And we have a new people, we have a new life over here. So in this perspective, Jesus' death is not necessarily a state. But it's gonna show up elsewhere, Jesus is a sin sacrifice. But here we have an, another understanding of Jesus' death. Um, the one in chapter 3 was Jesus' death was made him a fit to be the ark cover, to be the new temple. Okay, that's one. Now we have a separate one, a second one. Jesus' death now accomplishes uh, substitution. Not a punishment, but he dies um, so that we don't actually have to die. I mean, right? Uh, and also, his death is important because we can't do what he does. If we died, that doesn't get, that doesn't get us off the hook. Our death doesn't save us. Okay. But... Um, so let me see if I say this right. Um, it is part. It, it is participatory. But when Jesus died, we participate in his death, and therefore we move over here. So I'm trying to explain this in light of when we always talk about the Pino substitution atonement model, where Jesus dies for our sins and gets punished for it. Here we're not dealing with punishment at all. There's no punished language here. Okay. What we have here is just re representation, which means. Um, um, we died and we didn't die at the same time. <laughs> That's the problem, right? We somehow died, 
but we don't really die. Mm. Any questions on this? Are you saying we're represented by Jesus? Yeah, we participated in some in, in some real way. It's almost like okay, think about it this way: if we actually join into Jesus and become one with Him. Okay, so let's say we're, this is Jesus. We're inside now. This whole thing died. Okay, so we our status is now dead to the sinful world. This whole thing comes to life. We're now new, born a new life. Whatever punishment that happens happens onto the entire entire thing represented by Jesus, who bears the punishment. So we actually don't. Well, don't we in the sense that we're a part of him? Yeah, so we participate in the punishment. But what I mean is, Jesus only Jesus was on the cross, I'm not. You know what I'm saying? It's that substitution, yes, participation, yes. But did we participate, did we participate with Jesus on the cross? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, we participated in that. And no, I was not physically on the cross. I agree. What about, what about the idea that Jesus Jesus See, follows us to take up our cross and follow him? That's a different. That's a different issue. It's an issue. That's a different issue. That's not dealing with our entrance into into, in, into the kingdom of grace. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah. Is there a good example? No, it doesn't make sense. Right. <laughs> might be right. But... <laughs> it might be right, but it doesn't make sense. Can we, okay. I was trying to think, is, yeah. and, and I'm aware that your wife is sitting right here. How about marriage? Does marriage work in this at all? Huh? What do you think? I'm just trying to think of a metaphor. That, that yeah, you're talking, about one, you're talking about oneness, right? Um, uh, or another metaphor yeah. besides, besides, besides the law court that would help describe this. Yeah, well, this is not law court, obviously. This is totally not a law court imagery. Wait, so the kingdom of sin is condemnation, isn't it? Well, no, 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 that's not what I mean by this. This is a, this is a true nation. Two, it's a. He, Paul is playing with um, a, a kingdom imagery, and he's saying there's two countries, and to leave one, the only way to leave it is to die. It's like citizenship. Like, like let's say you're, you're in North Korea, and let's say the wall is really built really high, you can't get out. Okay, the only way to get out is to die. Then you stop being a citizen of North Korea. This is also what we've talked about where it's not that we don't enter in with Christ's death, we leave with Christ's death and we enter in with Christ's resurrection, right? Uh, well, yeah, either way, right? You leave the kingdom of sin through the death and you, and you rise right, on this side. Saying. Right, right, So imagine Jesus is a tunnel between the two right, kingdoms right. in which you kind of get through um, because, and via his death and resurrection. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like interplanetary travel. Sure. Like you, you get into the spaceship, the yeah. spaceship goes through the void, right? and the spaceship ends up at sure. another planet, and sure. you, you then are Th at this Think planet. it was a wormhole. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but, the thing, but the thing is, though, is that from that kingdom perspective, kingdom sin perspective, that entering that wormhole is, is death. It's now you're being canceled. Your status doesn't exist anymore. You are, you are finished off in there. It's going to make, make that much more clear in the next passage. But I feel like there's like atmosphere of the kingdom of sin is like getting into that wormhole because we still deal with yeah. sin. Right. You know, right, right. We can't completely stop one hundred percent. So so you know Douglas Moog um, has this great example and I think this it's a nice one. If you don't think interplanetary or interstellar and think in terms of two houses. Let's say you're a slave in one house. Okay? And then Jesus comes over here into this house and he dies. Okay? You hide in his body. <laughs> this, this is, is getting really, really weird. Traumatized. This is completely <laughs> weird now, okay? <laughs> this is, you're baptized into his body. So the, 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 the slave owners here are like, oh, my slave's dead. Even though you're alive inside the body, okay? My slave's dead. This is weird, okay? Oh, oh, so they, come to Monte Cristo. Sure, whatever. Yeah, they, they, they yeah, go ahead. The priest and hiding in the, yeah, the, in, the in the bag. In the bag, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, him up and look at him. Yeah, yeah. Except he's really heavy, as I recall. Right, yeah. So, so he, so you take this body, and they ship him out, and then they take him to the house next door, which is the, that, that, that person's original house, and there he resurrects. He's like, I'm alive! And you're hiding inside, you're like, hey, I'm over here now. <laughs> okay? Okay, now just, just go with me here, okay? Now what's going on here is now, you're standing, you're, you're now next door, no longer in this house of slavery, yeah. but the problem is you're standing right next to the wall, and you can hear everything the old master is saying. Now over here, in this house, you were a slave. 
Over here, you actually adopted to be the son and daughter of this new owner, which is an awesome place. But you're standing here next to the wall, and you're so used to listening to that guy. He's like, oh yeah, I should do what he told me to do. You're on this side of the wall, paying attention to every word, and what you really are being asked should be doing is walk away. And you have the freedom to. That's really chapter eight. Okay, we haven't got the chapter eight, and we're still doing the mechanism. Chapter six is the mechanism of getting to Jesus' dead body and getting out somehow. It's kind of weird. Wouldn't it be better if Jesus were explaining all these things rather than Paul? <laughs> because it's like, yeah, if he himself explained, it's like because he is the guy doing everything. Yeah, that would be cool, huh? Yeah, you, you're saying that. So wait, well you're saying that by Paul explaining this, you're finding it less believable? Is that the issue here? No, it's like if Jesus would explain it, it's like, yeah. I guess if he said outlandish things, who would take what, so, so, so if you want to say Jesus, you can say, okay, covenant. A covenant, of, um, this is the blood of my covenant, eat it. Yeah. So one with me, union with Christ business is definitely in Jesus. It's in Synoptic Gospel, also in John. Endlessly, you and I are one. My father and I are one. I'm praying that all the people you meet will become one with us, one with me. It's like his oneness language is going nuts. But he never suggested that baptism should be a way of doing it. It's it's by by which the way in which this actually occurs, right? But I think so. Paul. Oh, so this is where you get into question it, of. It always sounds like, like yeah. Jesus said all these things, yeah. and then after his death and resurrection, yeah. afterwards people decide, okay, he said us all these things. Let's do it. This yeah. way. Right. So, so I would push. I would push one more idea, okay? Which is this: that Paul, so this is where this is where I'm a, I'm a little on shaky ground, because I, but I don't I don't think I'm wrong, but I'm I'm a little more shaky because I think the scholarship is not scholarship is pushing this direction, but hasn't got there yet. Which is this: that this idea of participation, that is to say, substitution and um um and 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 representation. Is, is built into the idea of sacrifice itself. So that Paul is not creating something new. That if you look at any idea of when, we, we, when we're killing an animal, okay, how does killing animal sate God's anger? Do we really believe that God punished the animal? That guy, the animal got whacked, he gets, he gets punished. I get to. I, I. I. I don't get punished. Is that the vision? Is that the vision that they were seeing about, about sin sacrifices? I don't think so. In fact, we have good. I think we have good arguments. I don't have to get into all of it. That killing an animal is really about symbolic symbolic self death. When I kill an animal, I'm saying that's me. That animal represents my death. So what you're saying in the Old Testament, there was maybe an idea that I had already there, already present. Is that I'm dead. The animal's dead, I'm dead. When I do this and burn it before God, what I'm saying is, God, I'm dead. My previous life and the sin that went with it, it's wiped out. I have a new life with you now. Okay? Now, what's wrong with this new life? It's the same as the old one. <laughs> so it didn't do you any good. By participating and joining with a dead animal, that did not accomplish transformation. Right? If, but if that idea of, of the death of the person offering sacrifice is built in, and if Jesus is a, is, is a sacrifice, which everybody agrees, including Jesus, who argues that his death is a covenant initiation sacrifice, then I think for Paul, it's just very automatic to say, well, yeah, then, joining with him is different from any other sacrifice, because Jesus, unlike all the, anim all the other animals, first of all, it's human, second, he came back to life. What is the implication of that for us? Previously, we joined with animals, which means we died, and now we have a new life that is not transformed, and we sin again, and we get another animal, we kill that one, we start another new life. Symbolic death, symbolic death, symbolic death. And finally, now we have Jesus, in which we don't have to do it again, because we have a symbolic death, and then we are now participating in a new life in Him. So I would say, if that, if that is correct, then Paul is not making anything new. He's just, like, he just making clear what everybody already understood. That would make more sense to yeah, then rather than creating something brand new out of this. Is yeah. it kind of like earlier when you said, because mm -hmm. we did things like lie, the mm -hmm. punishment was you became a liar, yes. and that became your identity. Yes. So it's almost like if I tell a lie, I'm going to put that sin on this animal, mm -hmm. and that animal becomes the liar, because yes. that's the progression of my sin, yes. and then you kill it, you yep. kill the liar, yep. now I can kind of start with a clean slate. Exactly. So in exactly. Jesus, every time I do something, mm -hmm. 
and you say now you become a murderer or you become a cheater, mm -hmm. all those things continually die in Christ. Yes. And so I am constantly then given the ability to, be to not be any of those identities. Bingo. And now we're talking about the book of Hebrews is right on top of that. If yeah. I lie, I'm never a liar, but I can continue to seek exactly. to move forward into the kingdom. Exactly. So baptism is an outward symbol of putting my identity in Christ. Yes. The outward symbol of this of the our symbol of this inward reality that's happened of union with Christ. By being you being united with Christ, all those things happen that we just talked about. Death to sin, life to Christ, a life to Christ. Um, uh, uh, so, so the the, impl the implications of being united with Christ are so many that it's gonna take a long time to actually explore them all. Okay. So why do we have both baptism and the Eucharist? Um I would say baptism is the initiatory, Eucharist is, 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 a, is a covenantal renewal ceremony. Because we do it repeatedly. You only get baptized once. Mm -hmm. But you constantly retake to say, I am now re-covenanting with Christ. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this thing again and again. Jesus, I'm one with you. I'm one with you. I'm eating your body. You're inside me. And I'm inside you. This oneness covenant. Yeah. Reaffirmation of the desire to stay in covenant. Okay. So yeah, you, we're just beginning to touch on this. If you're one with Christ, holy cow, the kind of implication that has on, forget that, forget, think about, think about myst, the mystics. They get this. The mystics of the early church, they're constantly trying to see visions of the Trinity. Okay, why? Because they believed it. They believed that they're one with Christ. If I'm one with Christ, I am now inside the community of the Trinity. So think about the implication of that on mysticism, on visions, on can I actually see what I believe to be true? Can I experience what I believe to be true? If this is a reality, I should sense something. I should be able to see something. Okay. That's interesting. So that has, that has one, one aspect. In terms of ecclesiology, the fact that we're all squeezed, squished into Christ, means that there's a oneness to us all that we're just beginning to explore. Okay. And then of course the application on ethics is huge. And Paul in Corinthians says, you can't have sex with a prostitute. You're you're one with Jesus. You're, you're making Jesus have sex with a prostitute. What the heck are you doing? Right? So the oneness picture, the oneness imagery has just implication in ethics, in, in ecclesiology, in, 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 in mysticism, in, in we're just talking about salvation part here. But so much of it is centered on this idea. So that's why you don't sin more for grace to increase. Because yeah. if you sin, you become that it's died in Christ. There's yes. no increasing grace. There's well, it just first of all, you, you, you stop doing that. Don't, you, know, you got to cut it out, right? Because it's like, that's just silly to, to keep on sinning. Because you don't need the law anymore. You're in Christ. You have a, you have a new life, a life of Christ. Um, therefore, you don't go around sinning anymore. So that was the first 11 verses of chapter 6. Um, we're getting to the end here. Um, so here's the, here's the payoff right here. Let not sin therefore reign your moral bodies. There's that term again, reign. Basileuo, to be king. Don't let sin be the king. This is where he's saying, look, if you're on this side of the wall, don't let that voice on the other side run your life. I mean, I mean, what Mu would say about this. The slave is freed, but is sitting there while listening to the old master. Stop that. Don't let him reign over you. You're over here now. To make you obey their passions. Do not yield your member to sin as instrument of wickedness, but yield yourself to God. As men who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under Torah, but under grace. Now that is a surprising statement right there at the end. This should be, should, it should say, since you are not under sin, but under grace. Right? Paul throws in Torah, which is very interesting. Okay. Um, but does that make sense now? This is, the, this is the right conclusion. What we just talked about, all of a sudden, it's like, if you're living over here now, you shouldn't sin. Don't listen to that guy. It makes no sense to listen to him. Um, so... We're, since we're dead to the kingship of sin, therefore it makes no sense to allow sin to continue to rule. At the same time, our death to sin does not mean we do not sin. That's very, very basic from that verse right there, in verse 1. Right? 
there's no Paul is not a triumphalistic Christian like oh you can live it you can you can live a victorious life and never sin. And Paul never ever intimates that. Okay, so there's no sense of that at all. He's like oh you have to live a perfect life. No, otherwise he would never have to say that. Therefore, do not let sin reign your mortal bodies, because obviously that's a problem. <laughs> otherwise he would need to say that, right? So by saying that he's saying look if this happens to all Christians. We, we, we are free, and yet we have this tendency and powers in our bodies to act on us. And so it's an ongoing, continuing choice that we make to walk away from that wall and stop listening to that voice. Okay. Um, members, yield to your members. Uh, the word there, is, uh, instruments, literally is weapons or armor. So the imagery, once again, is kingship. And we are vi envisioned as soldiers. So, you know, we... You know, a, a knight comes to a king and offers the weapon, right? So I'm this I'm 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 you know, what Lord of the Rings? You know, you have my have sword, my you have my you have my axe. Oh. You know, I'm, I'm offering my service to you, right? So um, this is what's going on here. We have an offering of of of, of weapon of service before the king to to serve in his army, okay? And so we have that one, that imagery, and that will continue on. And then and he says, don't do that anymore. But duh, you're on this side, so stop doing that. Right? Don't offer your, your, your weapons to serve sin. You're on this side. And sin can't control you. And you're not under law, but under grace. That's the, f once again, the word Torah now uh, gets played with. And if, you, if we fill this out a little bit more, we have the kingdom of sin in which you know, Adam is rebelling, led to sin's rule. We have death for all. And we have sin without Torah. And then we have the Torah showing up. What's weird about this then is that the Torah belongs in the kingdom of sin. That's what Paul has done. Paul has put Torah there. The Jewish Torah now is under the, the kingdom of sin. Um, and the irony is, while you ha and in the kingdom of sin, you have the Torah, you cannot fulfill it. And now that you come here, you can fulfill it, yet you're not under it. You have to be not be under it to be able to fulfill, fulfill it. Paul's funky that way. Okay. Because, once again, Paul's going to get to this. Law was not intended to achieve justification, but to point out sin. So, you know, it's like, nope, 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 nope. Okay. But if you don't have the Torah perfectly written on your heart, yeah. which is obviously true because you're still sinning, then yeah. you need the Torah to realize that you're sinning? So the Torah, it still keeps pointing out sin, right? The Torah points out sin, um, but by not being under it, that is to say, we are not, uh, I mean, let's put it this way. None of us here are living under the Torah in the sense that we don't read it and follow it. Um, we break it all the time, every day, you know. You're touching people that you shouldn't be touching. You're eating food you shouldn't be eating. You're wearing clothing you shouldn't be wearing. Um, you know, you're breaking the Sabbath constantly. We're breaking, we're breaking all kinds of rules. We're clearly not under the Torah. And his point is, by seeking to live under the Torah, you will actually never get to the big point, which is the love of God, which we touched on earlier. You'll never get to become the restoration of the glory of God, to become the way you meant to be. Now, following all those rules will never get you there. Having those rules immediately tell you how flawed you are. Now that we're out of it, it tells us what sin is, but we have a path forward. We have a path forward. And that's chapter 8. Uh, we, we will see that in chapter 8. Okay. So, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? So, they're still asking, there's, he's answering the same set of questions, which is if you're not under Torah, can't you just sin like crazy? It's the same. It's the same objection as before. Should we sin? If you're under grace, sin. Go ahead and free, feel free to sin. If you're under, if you're not under the Torah, feel free to sin. Neither is true. I mean, the, the answer is obvious, right? Um, just like the previous objection, should we sin that grace may abound? No, because we're dead to sin. By no means. Do you not know that if you yield yourself to as to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. 
I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as just, come on. Okay. Well, it's Paul. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now yield your members to righteousness is for sanctification. Okay. Same underlying reality. Kingdom of a kingdom of sin, kingdom of grace. Once you have moved, therefore no longer surrender to, to if you're if you're on this side, why would you want to serve the other side? If you're freed from slavery to sin, if you're now slavery to if you're a slave to righteousness, which he says, okay, that's I'm speaking. I'm speaking in human terms. I'm speaking in terms that you get because I'm trying to draw a parallel. Okay, you're a slave to sin. You're a slave to righteousness. You have to choose to be slave to one or the other. And once you choose that, once you yield up that that sword, you become a slave. You become ruled by that side. So you have, you're choosing between slave to sin or slave to God. And Paul said that that sounds a little off. So I'm going to talk in human terms. But really, what I'm going to get at is a slavery to righteousness is really about being sons and daughters of God and the full restoration. That's going to come up in chapter 8. Okay, but right now he's saying, I'm drawing a parallel. So this, that's what he's saying. I'm doing human terms, okay? Just, just make sure you understand what I'm saying. Um, um, should we sin because we're not under law? No, because we've chosen a different master. We've, we yielded our weapons to a different master. Therefore, it makes no sense to continue to follow the dictates of the previous master. So, in these terms, then, once again, uh, s salvation and reconciliation is cast into terms of two realms in which you have a choice to be a slave in one or the other. It's not, I'm the th free agent, I can be free and live my own life. No, either you're a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. That, those are the human choices. And if that's the case, then, and, the, and Torah belongs on this side, well, then, live on this side and you're not going to sin more because of it right? turning away from the Torah doesn't mean you will lead you to more sin right? on the contrary you should probably sin less even without especially without the Torah does that make sense? okay it does make sense, man. I would add that in this whole uh, the direction that we're talking about, mm -hmm. I feel like slaves of God yeah. seems clearly to be uh, a glorious positive. Yes. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned that sometimes when people talk about God's punishment, yeah, it seems like slaves of God could be a negative, or like a like we're trapped. Right, right, right. But it seems like here it's like slaves of God is, is the most beautiful thing that we could want. Right, and which is why he says, I'm, I'm saying this in human terms. I'm, I'm, I guess he's trying to say, look, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to put it in this into a, into a parallel situation in which a, a soldier surrenders his choice. He, he's offering his service to one or the other, right? And, and if you do that, you become enslaved. So he's, he's creating a parallel situation. But he's saying, this is human terms, really. Be a slave of righteousness is really the ways to be human. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to the ultimate freedom. Okay. But we haven't got there yet. We haven't got there yet. Okay. So he's, he's, he's wants to, he wants to stay with this metaphor for a little longer. Haven't got there meaning Paul hasn't gotten there or haven't got there meaning that in a Paul, Paul hasn't got there yet. Okay. Paul in chapter 8 is going to say, really what's going on is his adoption. Okay. You're not really slaves at all. No, let's not be silly about it. This is awesome. This is going to be awesome okay. stuff. Right? But he, right now he's creating this parallel. Okay. Um, so you your members to righteous for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But then what return did you get from the things which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the return you get is sanctification and its end, eternal life. Life of the new age. See, we're getting there. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you have a basic choice here. He says, look, once you have encountered Jesus and have died and resurrected with him, you're in this new life, you can choose to be a slave of sin if you want to. That's just, but that's just silly. Because what do you get when you, when you become a slave of sin? What, what wage does it offer you? In the kingdom, in the kingdom of sin, as a soldier in its army, 
you get paid. And the payment you get is death. That sucks. In the kingdom of life, you don't have a wage. You have a free gift. And the free gift is the life of, life of the age, the final life that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in terms of just pure utilitarian, like choosing between the two, okay, once I go, yeah, what if I don't want to, what if I enjoy being a sinful life? Yeah, but you know what the payoff at the end is, right? right? Being, being, serving, serving in the army of, of, this, of, of, of the satanic realm, get you, a sinful realm, gets you absolutely nowhere. So this, I mean, I know people sometimes read the page, we just read that as punishment of sin. You know, they, they read that verse as punishment. I think this reads it much better. The idea of two kingdoms. The verse is really getting at this metaphor of if you serve sin, you get paid a wage. This is this is your salary. And your salary is kind of a lousy. It's crappy pay. Mm. It's worse than minimum wage. <laughs> okay? That's what's going on here. That's the imagery here. It's not about, you know, the punishment of sin is death. In fact, this is not what God gives you. Death is not what God gives you. Death is what sin gives you. The kingdom of sin gives you death as, as, as a salary. Any questions? Okay. See, I think that's, chapter 6 is actually fairly clear once you get the, the big picture under, understanding. And everything else fits. And now we're going to come, come back to the point that Paul is... Paul is explaining something that he, I wish he explained a little earlier. And so we're, we're, we're going a little backwards logically, which is how do you get away from sin via death? Okay, so he's actually going to explore this. And I said, it's just, the, so he actually talks about it a little bit more. So this is a continuation idea from, from Romans 6. Do you not know, brother, for I am speaking to those who know the Torah. Okay, you got to know the Torah. Now the Torah is binding on a person only during his life. So he's making the argument about um, uh, 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 living and versus living versus death. But thus, a married woman is bound by Torah to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. If she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Okay? Very simple rule, right? The rule is very very basic. You have, we have in, in the Torah basic understanding that, that a covenant relationship is created between a man and a woman. One of them dies, the other one's free to then go with somebody else. Okay, so death creates that separation. Okay, so Paul's going to take this metaphor and apply it to Christians. Right? Likewise, my brothers, you have died to the Torah through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that you, we may bear fruit for God. Now, there's something problematic with this metaphor, or with this analogy, right? If, and it's not a good, not a good one, not a perfect one. And let me explain. Um, in the in the original picture, you have the woman, and her husband dies, and then she marries another person. Okay. In our situation, the person dies. <laughs> so it's kind of like okay, it's a little off. It's not a perfect metaphor. Uh, so, I, I don't think we should push the analogy too far. Except to say the general understanding is death dissolves certain kinds of relationships. So by our death through Jesus, our relationship with sin is dissolved. That's what he's getting at here. So we're no longer slaves. So therefore, you can you're feel free to belong to another. So there's a problem with the analogy, but we get the general sense. Let me go, Paul. Okay. Um, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. While we are living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the Torah, here we go again with the Torah, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the Torah, dead to that which has held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. Okay. And suddenly the Spirit shows up. And we're like, hey, we've been talking about baptism the whole time. You know, and then Panuma, Ruach pops in finally. Okay. So, so I think we're on the right track with Paul, with, with Paul here. Um, uh, once again, we have 
a connection of between Torah and sinful behavior. This is multiple times now. We're going to see it again. Um, in Romans 6, we saw earlier, uh, but then are we to sin because we're not under Torah, but under grace? By no means. Um, and the answer to that one is, uh, we should not sin because by sinning, we become slaves of sin again, and the slavery to sin only brings death. We saw that. And in chapter 7, verse 1, the question is, um, do you not know that the law is binding on a person only doing his life? Yeah, so this is so this so so, so Romans seven one is a second question, second answer to that original question. Does that make sense? There's an original question: Should we sin because we're not under law but under grace? What well, question? Answer number one is: um, We we should not sin because we become slaves of sin again, and, and slavery to sin sucks. The second question is: We should not sin because we're dead. Okay, you're dead, and by dying. You, it's the, the, the all the things that forces you to sin, only binding on those people who are alive in the in the kingdom of sin. You're a dead man. It doesn't apply to you. The law does not apply to you. Does that make sense? He's talking to a bunch of dead people. Okay. Um. Paul keeps bringing back the problem of the Torah and he's going to explore it much further in the rest of chapter 7 which we will get to next time but you can see it already here right the Torah brings wrath but where there's no wrath no Torah there's no transgression he hints at this in, in chapter 4 chapter 5 sin indeed was in the world before Torah was given but sin is not counted where there is no Torah so no counting of Torah of sin law Torah came in to increase the trespass okay and then here finally we have we're living in the flesh, our sinful passion were aroused by the Torah. At work in our members produce death, but we're not discharged from the Torah. Right. So he is going to explore that whole thing in full, but it's been gradually hinting at, at, through, through the book of, through the book of Romans. Okay. Um, any questions? Before we get to the final, final thing. Um, the final thing um, the final thing is this what exactly is this life that we live in Jesus right we, we resurrect it with him okay and, and so Paul has to Paul has to get there and he, he kind of gets there right here he's saying look the reason we're not going to live that old life anymore is we're not under the written code, but the new life of the Spirit. And that's where it kind of comes in. Um, so, and this is, this is really the first time that Paul brings up the Spirit as kind of the motivating power for this new life. Right? So we've been talking about you're reconciled with God. Okay, you, you, you have a new temple, your sins forgiven, reconciled with God. It is based on faith, yes, and, and now it's you're dead to sin, that's cool. Your new life in Christ, that's great. Um, what is this new life in Christ powered by? What, what, is the, what really makes it work and makes it go? And he's, he's now bringing the Spirit into this now. And once again, Paul is not creating new things. He's drawing straight from the Old Testament, also from Jesus, who teaches about Spirit as well. Um, so, Isaiah 44. Now listen, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen, this is what Yahweh says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant Yeshu, Yeshu, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up like grass and waters, like willow, sorry, like willows by flowing streams. This one I will, will say, I am Yahweh's. Another one calls himself by the name of Jacob. Another one write on his hand, Yahweh's, and surname himself by the name of Israel. There's a whole bunch of people who are going to say, I belong to God. I belong to God. Because they're going to be, they're going to have the spirit upon them. Okay. So there's this idea in the final age of the spirit being poured out on God's people. Um, Isaiah 50, uh, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those who... In Jacob, who repent of their sins, declares Yahweh, As for me, this is my covenant with them. 
My spirit, who is on you, and my words I have put in your mouth, will not depart from your mouth, or from the mouth of your children, or from the mouth of your descendants from this time on and forever. So that final day is coming, and all the descendants, all the children, the new people of God, will have a spirit on them. So if you think about the previous argument we've been following about God's faithfulness, God's grace, you know, to commitment to make things right. So finally, what we have finally is the ultimate step in making things right. God is going to pour His Spirit into people to transform them. Um, the example I always use is, you know, if you have a teacher who's teaching writing and students are writing very badly, okay? So what can you do? Well, you can lay out the rubric for them. That's like the Torah. They go, oh, wow, my writing sucks based on the rubric. Previously, they just know, they, previously the writing was just bad, but they can't tell what's wrong with it. Okay, now you have the rubric that tells you, oh, it should sound like this and like this, like clarity, all this, like, wow, my writing stinks, but they can't write any better. Okay, now the substitutionary atonement understanding of, of, of this whole thing is what God does is God writes the paper for the student <laughs> and say, I'm going to turn it in for you so you have my paper and I'm going to then take your bag, no, no, I'm going to have my son or my daughter write, write a paper and they're going to get you just going to switch papers. Okay, so my son gets the F or my daughter gets the F, you get the A. Okay, even though you're still a lousy writer. That would be the um, I'm, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven mode of Christianity. I'm, 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 I suck, but God forgave me and gave me all the credit that Jesus, that Jesus got. If this is better for it's not going to be perfect, okay? okay. <laughs> what Paul's really getting at here is this, okay? What God's going to do is, the teacher's going to do is, is I'm going to come and write with you. I'm going to work with you. Okay. I'm going to sit down and work with you. I'm going to live in your house. I'm going I'm to be right next to you, help you write every single paper. And every paper is going to be a collaboration. It's going to be so tight that I'm going to be inside your mind. Okay, listen to me. You don't. Okay, if somebody else is telling you to write a bad paper, no, 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 no. Listen to this one. Okay, it's going to be a collaborative process all the way through. And I'm going to make sure because of my faithfulness and my power, I'm going to make sure you write a good paper. Okay, and that's the grace of God and the power of God. To accomplish something like that with every single person. Now, would that mean that, that every paper is perfect? The first one, not so much. They get better, or it can get worse, depending on the person. But it depends on the collaboration. But the teacher never gives up, and it keeps right, keeps working, keeps working, keeps working. Sorry. <laughs> Serena teaches teach writing, so, you know, it's like, sorry. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the spirit that's being offered here. It's that, that, that permanent collaboration, the enter in of God into us or us into God, right? Because you're in Christ, what happens? You, you drink his spirit. And everything we do becomes a collaborative effort. Um, the, the, the Orthodox churches teach this. They say, um, Christ became man. God became man so that man can become God. The, that's the, the, the Eastern Orthodox emphasis on deification of man. They have... Now, that sounds a little weird. Okay? Because... This is, is, is what you're saying. Yes, exactly what I'm saying. And, and you think about... What Adam wanted, what Eve want? want like they want to be like God. So that's, that's what the Orthodox are reading. That they're, they're getting this idea that Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. And they went about it via rebelling against God in order to elevate themselves. And, and what God thinks, no, 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 it's always been that I wanted you to be like me. I want you to elevate you. I want you to pull you into the community of the Trinity. But it's a community of love and faith, not of rebellion. So come to me and join me. Join us. Right? So that's kind of the, the, the idea here is that by entering into Christ, you have a life inside Christ. Um, it's our deification. Sounds a little off, I know. 
We don't teach that a lot. The Orthodox just do a lot more of this. Okay? But I, th I think they are onto something. Um, if we're inside Christ, then the Spirit is poured out on us. Just be, otherwise, you, you're not in Christ. It's definitional. You're in Christ, you have the Spirit. You have to, because the Spirit is, is infused in Christ. Then you will know that I am in Israel and I am Yahweh your God, that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What will enable Israelites to maintain covenant? In the Old Testament, the answer is the Holy Spirit. For Paul says, that age is now arrived. The age is now here. What they've been waiting for has now arrived. Once again, continu in continuity with the, with, the, with the Old Testament, the Old Torah, but apart from it. So this is the Jesus option. It's a death to the old way of life, death to the kingdom of sin, and paradoxically the Torah, life to grace and spirit, and transformation is via the Holy Spirit who will bring about the transformed nature, the glory of God. And we put our hope in that. The Jesus option. Questions? Yeah. Um, two questions. First, the collaboration transformation thing. Does that, do they really work together? Can you be transformed via collaboration? It's a good question. Um, this is where Paul, Paul, well, Paul talks about walk, right? He always said, if you talk, walk with, walk with the Spirit, you know, submit to the Spirit. Um, it's always present progressive. It's always something that's an ongoing choice. So I do think that as collaboration happens, um, uh, we we are shaped by our experiences. Um, so, as we I think we collaborate more, it gets easier to collaborate. We resist more, it becomes easier to resist. Um, so it's a it's it's. So yeah, I agree. I, I think you're right. Col collaboration leads to transformation. In fact, it might be the only way that happens. Let me think about that. It makes mm -hmm. sense because you're listening to that new voice because mm -hmm. I, mean, I think about the writing idea you know when kids come in we talk the writing's better and kids who totally blow me off or if mm -hmm. I write suggestions I'm writing the same suggestions every time and their right. writing is still the same horrible mess mm -hmm. but when they listen and right. they try new things it gets better right and then what happens is if you hear if you hear it eventually I think it internalizes the transformation idea is that somehow it becomes part of who you are mm -hmm. so let's say you know I come I'm, I'm a, you know I come I, 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 I'm a horrible person. I, I trust in Jesus. The Spirit comes and says, "Why don't you try this thing?" I'm like, "I don't know. No, fine. Let's try it out. Let's do it." And now I'm doing something a little different in my life. And if I do it enough, it becomes something internal. And then, it, it, the voice keeps going. There's more to this. There's more. In fact, it's there's it's a lot more. It keeps going. And it's, and you can learn this. You can learn this. And and I think once we adopt the attitude of the learner, um, it becomes way easier. And it, it becomes, oh, there's more here, there's more here. And so that, that process of, of working with the Holy Spirit in our lives um, is very much, that, very much relational. It's, 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 not a, it's not a bunch of rules to follow. It's every day, you know, first of all, creating time to pray and talk to God, um, but also developing that sensitivity. It's like, okay, what am I, you know, what does God has in mind? Given that this is a collaborative venture, my life is a collaborative venture with God. What does God have in mind for me? Um, and giving Him space and have that voice. So, see, the thing is, this, this discussion pushes us right into spiritual disciplines. Okay, right into something that's rubber meets the road. Because otherwise, it's just this the Spirit is supposed to in, empower us to do all this. And we're like, we can't do any of this. Right? This, this sounds really cool. We're having a new life in Christ. But we feel, you know, swamped by the world around us. So how does it happen? Um, and I wish Paul actually had a more of a chapter on that. 
Like how do you how do you walk with the spirit on a daily basis? Um, and he does it. I don't think. I don't recall that. I mean, we get to chapter twelve. Um, you have some advice about stuff, but um, he doesn't seem to have taught them. Uh, not in Romans anyway. So. So you let this old identity go. Do the things of Jesus yeah. resurrect. You are slowly transformed uh, mm -hmm. via the Holy Spirit. And how do you know? How do you know that you're working with the Holy Spirit that you cannot see or hear? Or yeah, yeah. There's no tangible yeah. evidence. How do you know? Right. You're not making it all up inside your head. Yeah, it's a great question. A fantastic question. Um, I would say initially you don't. It's weird. Um, I, I would say um, the the f faith is believe that first of all so faith means believing that there is God there is Jesus and when I pray that he actually exists and he hears me so that's like that's a big deal I, I, I remember um, in college it was a tremendous um, moment of revelation for my for me that I don't have to sense a thing for God to be present all I have to imagine is when I close my eyes, you know, you got, you know what? I can't sense right now anybody in this room. I'm not hearing things, <laughs> and that. But if you close your eyes and then your friend's not talking, is that person there? But yet, believe that person is there because why? Because I seen them earlier. I'm trusting my memory. Right? There's a faith involved in that. I'm trusting on my own memory now. When I'm talking to God, I, I have I have faith that He is listening and that He's in the present in the room and listening to me. It doesn't depend on sensations to start with. That was first my most one of the most helpful revelation I had um, um, uh, um, in college. The second one is this: is that there actually is a active element to this, and if you see this repeatedly, He talks about um, ah, get out of seven, chapter seven. Yield yourselves as obedient slaves. There is a active choice that we make. Now, I cannot actively choose to be different. Sometimes I can try. It gets tiring. Okay, transformation doesn't... I don't choose transformation. I do choose experiences that transform me. So, that's where the choices come in. I can either... If we're back in college, I can either go to a Bible study or go hang out with my friends and sit around and talk about stuff. I can either join join this group or try that or try to set some time to pray even though it's not going very far. I can make choices that put me in a position where God can do something with me. And the question is, is God going to respond to those choices? We take steps toward God. Is that the Holy Spirit? Those are choices that he made. Yeah. So it's, a, so it's a bit circular, right? For example, but, but, but what I mean by this is I can't change myself, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be have better, have better temper, temper with myself or, or more patience. I can't accomplish that. But I can, given what I know about the Bible, say, you know what? I'm going to try to set apart some time, some time to pray. Right? That was a, a big choice I made in college that made a huge difference. Now, was that a Holy Spirit thing or is it a my thing? I don't know. But I know that making that decision changed everything. That I sat down and said, okay, I'm going to be serious about this. How do I, be, how do I express my seriousness about this? If I, do I believe this or not? My seriousness is, okay, I'm going to, and so that was my sophomore year, junior, no, junior year in college, I sat down and I said, I'm going to stop doing my homework at 10 o'clock every night, and I'm going to spend an hour reading, reading scripture and praying, and also I'm going to, to wash the dishes of my, all my roommates for one semester. It was a decision I made. Where did that come from? I know it was a spirit working? Possibly. But it was one of those things where I got so frustrated with my life and with what everybody's telling me and I said, you know what? I'm just going to create space through acts of service and through acts of reading. I'm going to limit my, my schoolwork. I'm just going to put a wall around it. If I don't finish the homework, I'm not going to finish it because by 10 o'clock I'm done. I've stopped. 
I'm going to create that space. Will God change my life through it? I don't know. But I'm going to be faithful. Now, you can say that's the spirit already working. That probably is. Most likely it is. But it was something that I could do, which is at least make a decision how to spend my time and stick to it. I was at a place where I could do that. And maybe years before I couldn't. I certainly couldn't do it in high school. Um, but somehow I got to the point where I could do that. Um, I think we're, most of us are in a position where we can do that. Right. I think that's possible. Maybe kids, you know, they can't, they're like, you know, young children cannot do that. But we can. Does that help? Maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you, you make these choices. I guess yeah. you're saying there is no way to really know. Not initially. Its impact or Un until you see it afterwards, it's always rearview mirror. It's like you're, you. No, you can't. It's like it's like you can't do it ahead of time. You're, you're doing the stuff. You're like, wait, is this the right direction? You're sensing. You're kind of pushing forward, and then suddenly, like, oh yeah, that makes that makes all the sense in the world. It's, and then you you look at back at the transformation in your life. Like, whoa, look at this. Look what has happened the past 20, 30 years. So it takes perspective. Um. But it, it, it doesn't work like, oh, I, I, this is how you hear the, hear the voice of God. Um, it doesn't work that way. It, it works, it, it's a, but I think it gets easier. That you get used to certain things, um, certain ways of, of, of the spirit working. Um, it's like, do you have you taken social dancing? You have a new partner. What happens in, with a new partner, right? They give you signal, right? And you guys run into each other, step on each other's toes, all kinds of stuff. You're like, well, what's going on? I don't know what the, I don't know what he wants. I mean, you're 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 the being led, right? So you know, I stand with Serena. It's like I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and 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 the signals are either too hard or too strong, or that person's not doing anything. You're like, I don't know what you want from me. Which is dancing with a partner to be going on for a year, a couple, two, a couple years. You guys work together. You just know. Right, one twinge of the finger. Oh, I know what's coming up next. That's the. That's the. That's the. The, the spirit relational aspect of this. And it comes to experience. There's no. There's no. Papers that you can write. Or I mean, there's no uh, manuals to read. We should. We have to get going. But let me pray first. Um, Father, we're grateful for your Holy Spirit. We're grateful for grace and grateful that you died so we died with you, but we don't have to pay the, pay the penalty. And we are have this new life in you. We're grateful that you are committed to us and you are going to, to make it work and you're going to make things right so that we are right. Help us to trust that Help us to move in that process. Help us to, to work and collaborate with your spirit so that we become fully your sons and daughters. We look forward to that day. In Jesus' name we pray.